And I think collectively we lost about 500 pounds over, ah, that would have been about a year. About maybe. a year, yeah. And so it was just dramatic results. I, I dropped 45 pounds in six weeks. It's been almost 10 years ago and I'm old, so I can't remember. But, I, but anyway, it was a pretty dramatic thing. I couldn't believe I went back to my high school weight and I thought that's not possible. And uh, so it really, it really changed my, my life. I had issues with rotator cuff. Uh, tennis elbow and that sort of thing, all that went away within a couple Current of years. healthcare system isn't about health, wellness, and longevity. It's crisis intervention and revenue generation. All right, hey, welcome everybody to the Crisco and Company podcast. I'm your host, Joyce Carisco. Joining me is Dr. Lee Carisco, and we are so excited to have uh, the founders and owners of Small Box Entertainment are joining us today. They actually produced Disease Reversal Hope as well as uh, the box office hit, um, Eating You Alive, which had such a huge impact on my vegan journey. So welcome, Paul and, and Mary Lee. How are you today? Great. And we're doing great. great. Thank great. you. Thank you for having us. Well, I'm very interested in learning a little bit about the backstory. How did you both become whole food plant based? What was that journey like? Uh, <laughs> go ahead, Mary. You you <laughs> it, it, it actually wasn't as dramatic a journey for me um, because my, my background growing up, my mom was really keen on, you know, healthy eating. Uh, I remember we would go camping and she would get those, you know, those little mini boxes of cereal that used to come in packs that had the Fruit Loops or the Corn Pops or whatever, the Raisin Bran. And she always made us eat the Cheerio ones first. And then we could only have the sugared ones every now and again. And it, more than likely when we were on a vacation, like if we went camping or something, but typically we weren't allowed to have sugar much in the home. And, um, but I did grow up eating meat. Um, we were not vegetarians, although at about the age of 10, I decided for whatever reason that I needed to become a vegetarian that lasted for about a year. Um, because unlike my sister, I actually really liked the taste of meat and craved it. My mom used to call me her little carniv. Um, and, uh, that started quite early. Um, I'm told uh, pro probably about the age of three over Thanksgiving dinner when I wanted Turkey. And my mom told me that you didn't want that old dirty bird. And I told her that I did too want that old dirty bird. <laughs> so, so apparently it started quite early. Um, but then, so I had bouts of vegetarianism all throughout my life. My parent, my mom lost both her parents to cancer, started doing a little research. And at that point in time, she kind of stopped fixing meat at home for meals. But then when we went out, my dad would usually have a steak or something like that. Um, and so you know, that kind of was an off and on thing. Uh, fast forward to all of these years, and I had been a vegetarian for a long time um, with occasional uh, bouts of, of fresh salmon steak from time to time. And then I started working with Paul. And uh, usually we do a debrief after a long shoot. Uh, we go out to a nice restaurant and ended mm -hmm. up, you know, I, I had steak or something. Uh, along those lines and kind of got back into the meat eating things and put on weight, honestly, um, that I'd not carried for a little while. And I was a huge dairy holic from the get go, loved cheese, milk, sour cream, cottage cheese. You could never have enough. enough. And, and I almost burnt the house down once, um, doing melted cheese in a toaster oven <laughs> and uh, was not paying attention and it caught on fire. Um, so scared my mom, uh, of course, and uh, it was a rather traumatic experience. So at least I didn't toast cheese in the toaster oven, at least for a really, really long time after that, but still a cheeseaholic and would buy the little bricks of Havarti with dill, you know, and eat one all myself in one setting with crackers. You know, it was just, it was horrible. Um, but started noticing some issues and, um, in working with Paul, we were introduced to a, a physician who was doing a, a community focused program where he would do lectures on health, a uh, whole food plant-based health, uh, and nutrition, a nutritional approach to reversing chronic disease. And we 
got a chance to sit down and talk with them as they were running this program about some things and became intrigued with it at that point. And I'll let Paul kind of give you up to that point of his story as well, because <laughs> it was quite a bit different than mine. <laughs> uh, my story is simple. I was uh, raised in the South. And so every meal was identified with the meat that we had. And uh, so I, I loved every kind of meat. And I still, I mean, I would tell anybody that asked me, I didn't stop eating meat because I don't like the way it tasted. It tasted great to me, but I stopped doing it because I believed it was killing me. And so uh, I, I meet with every meal, but my biggest thing was a problem with sugar, which I had no idea that that was really an issue until I became a whole food plant-based and decided to try to stop doing that. And then I realized, oh, wait a second, I, I'm, I'm addicted to this is hard. So I, that really was my we did meat and dairy and everything you can imagine my entire life. So for me at, at 47, when we made the transition, I had really, I, I'm a skeptic, so I didn't believe that it would make any difference whatsoever, but I had watched my father go through uh, a heart attack and a stroke within about a week of each other. And so watching that happen and seeing what he went through, uh, I thought I'm destined for this. It's just, it's in my genes. And so I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go through this. So if this by any chance works, heck, I'll give it a shot. And, but not believing. And then we get to this point to where we meet with this physician because they're needing marketing paraphernalia for their sessions. And so we, we went ahead and met with them on a Sunday morning. I'll never forget. We met with them and had breakfast with them and they prepared. I won't remember everything, but I remember the millet, the millet waffles and at the time, I thought, this is disgusting, but I'm going to be polite and kind, and I'm going to eat this and, and, and throw up later. And so, but I really, but I left that day, and they said, watch Forks Over Knives. And so I went home, and I watched Forks Over Knives. And then I called Marilee because I can't boil water. And so I said, would you want to try this? And so she said, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll try, because she was always more healthy than, than me. Anyhow, I was kind of, a, I was the, the bad one. So anyhow, we started going down this path as a team. She said she would do it. She started preparing food. We had another person on the team that began preparing food for our small company. And so we had about five people. And I think collectively we lost about 500 pounds oh over, God. ah, that would have been about a year about maybe. A year, yeah. And oh. so it was just dramatic results. I, I dropped 40 Five. five pounds in six weeks. It's been almost 10 years ago and I'm old, so I can't remember. But I, but anyway, it was a pretty dramatic thing. I couldn't believe I went back to my high school weight and I thought that's not possible. And uh, so it really, it really changed my, my life. I had issues with rotator cuff, uh, tennis elbow and that sort of thing. All that went away within a couple of weeks. Uh, it was just amazing. So, so for me, it was a tremendous, tremendous thing that changed my life. I didn't expect the, you know, the elbow and the rotator cuff to get better by, from a dietary change, but, you know, who knew? Uh, he didn't yeah, either. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I mean, I didn't believe anything would get better. I didn't, I didn't believe in any of it. And, and literally, the crazy thing is, and, and since then, we've interviewed uh, Dr. Jimmy Conway. Jimmy Conway, who's an orthopedic surgeon in uh, Oklahoma City. You guys probably know him. But he, uh, yeah. he, he talked to us a lot about rotator cuff issues and explained the fact that that literally – when people have rotator cuff issues, many, many times, that's a precursor to heart disease. I mean, that, that's literally because the, the vessels are all, you know, here in the shoulder. So it's not getting the circulation because of the food that we're eating. So uh, anyway, that's how he explained it to me. I'm not a doctor, so you guys could talk about that. But anyway, I just know that it, it really did quickly change my life. My father and my mother and my sister all went on the on the lifestyle change. My sister had been uh, had had rheumatoid arthritis since she was seven or eight. I can't remember. She's eight years older than I am, and uh, and she would have been at that time fifty five, I guess. And so, within nine months of making the transition, she was she for the first time got off all her meds and could get up in the morning and exercise and run and do everything that she had forgotten that she could do. So it really, really just changed her life. My mom went in for, uh, she had blockage uh, in her carotid arteries and uh, she changed her way of eating. Three months later went in and said there was no issue with it at that point. 
my dad dropped probably 40 pounds and it changed his life tremendously. And so it really did just, it, it, it changed my family's life completely. This is just amazing. Now, Lee and I battle the carnivore diet. Yeah. Everybody's talking about keto. We get a lot of people that are carnivores. They're on the carnivore diet. They've dropped weight. They claim to have reverse diabetes. Of course, as Lee will state, if you just get rid of a lot of the processed foods, yeah, the first few months, maybe even years, you're on a, on a carnivore diet, you're going to see some health benefits. You are going to drop some weight, mm -hmm. but it will catch up to you. Unfortunately, there are no long-term studies um, proving the benefits of a carnivore-specific diet. Had either of you ever tried a carnivore diet? <laughs> uh yeah, I, I, to be honest with you, I'm an idiot. I don't even know what a real carnivore diet is, but my goodness alive, I ate a lot. But you ate a lot of processed foods, and actually keto, yeah, yeah. keto actually off, removes a lot of the processed yeah. so foods. So if, if I stayed off of that, so, I have no idea what would have happened. But yeah, I, I never looked into that. I had never really dieted very much. I think, well, actually I had. I had done a, a little bit of that, but that's beside the point, I'm so. <laughs> So no, uh, we've never really experienced much with keto. I don't, I actually know at this time that, that keto was such a massive thing. It was sort of just starting, I think, when we were kind of going through all of this. Um, you know, it's become much bigger um, over the last few years, but at, at, but that, at that time, I, I don't think it was as big of a deal yet. It hadn't, the craze hadn't really caught on, Yeah. you know, prevalently. <laughs> if that's even a word, but <laughs> there, there's not a lot of data on about a carnivore diet per se long-term. But if you look at these cultures like the Inuit and the Maasai that eat a very, very, very meat heavy diet, their life expectancy is only in the forties. And also um, mm -hmm. if you look at sort of the longitudinal studies, you know, eating low carb goes with about a 30% increase all cause mortality. So, you know, we're not, a, we're not a fan at all. Um, when you when you started making this change, uh, you know, it sounded like there was a little bit of skepticism there. Did you find that your taste buds changed and you started to enjoy the food more? I did. I, I really did. It, it, it was amazing because I had never I was really like a five year old child in terms of my dietary habits. If I had eaten it or not, I didn't like it if I hadn't had it before. You know, it's like, I don't like that. Well, why don't you like it? I don't know. I just don't like it. I don't eat it. So that was kind of my way of eating. So plants, I, I ate some beans. I didn't do salads. I didn't do lo a lot of stuff that I do now. And I thought that, you know, I thought a lot of things were, would be disgusting, but I actually really, really enjoyed it. My palate changed. And a lot of things that I thought there were things that I actually had to maybe acquire a bit of a taste for, but I was really more surprised that I didn't miss the meat. I didn't really have to to kind of uh, miss anything in terms of the flavors. And while I did transition a bit, some of the things like I still struggle with like beets. I don't, <laughs> I can't do beets, but, but there are a lot of other things that I actually do like, and it wasn't a difficult transition. And, I, and the biggest thing for me that I remember, it's been so many years, but the biggest thing I remember was the fear that I was going to go hungry. And, and I, didn't at all. I was actually eating more food then than I was eating before. It's just local. Uh, the calorie intake was low, but the food intake was a lot. And so I wasn't hungry. I was totally, you know, I was full and, and felt great. But I mean, yes, there were transit. There was a transitional time, I guess, in terms of taste, palate changed a bit, but that wasn't so difficult for me, actually. I expect it to be a lot harder than what it was. Gut changes were significant. <laughs> You know, and it, when you're going through that transition, your body doesn't know what to do with the, the new nutrition that you're putting into it. So it seems like your 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 colon and your <laughs> ga ga gastric system is yeah. is having a bit of an issue during that time. I used to joke around how all of us just carried around a little, you know, mini box of matches with us. And and if you were talking in a group setting and one of the people backed away from the group, you just let them go. <laughs> but thankfully, those types of transitional things didn't last that long, you know, maybe a couple of weeks. A couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> years. 
<laughs> I, no, I mean, I'm funny joking. because Paul, just this morning I was cleaning, I'm trying to do some spring cleaning. So I've been cleaning out a bunch of drawers in the kitchen and I happened upon a couple of bottles of Beano. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could totally yeah. relate to that. For yeah. sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it really was. You're, for, to me, for the first few weeks, we were peeling paint off the walls. I mean, it was <laughs> it was rough there for a bit because I was settling in, I think all of us, but it, it, it all, it was fine in time. And it was, yeah. obviously, it was worth, it was worth every bit of it. Yeah. yeah, matches and a good sense of humor will get you through that transitional period, no problem. <laughs> well, you know, I'm, so I can only venture to guess all of this experience led to you producing Eating You Alive. Can you tell tell us a little bit about that journey? And I can only appreciate the fact that you probably, in interviewing the people, I mean, you have so many heavy hitters that join you on that project. Um, Dr. Barnard, hey. Dr. Greger, you've got James Cameron, I think he was yeah. in Eating You Alive. Yeah. Yeah. Did it just further just underscore the decision that you had made? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think that first year that we were going through the transition as a team, you know, it's, it's like, I think anything you do that's new, you know, I think you with flying as an example, um, you're so excited about that. You have such a passion for it. It becomes a, a bit of an obsession. And it was that way with our team as well, because we were experiencing all these phenomenal transformations and it, so it made us hungry for, you know, what all was out there on the subject matter. So my goodness, at the time, I think we watched pretty much every documentary there was out there on the subject after we had watched Forks Over Knives. Uh, we were looking up articles and, and books and, you know, going to YouTube and looking up people and finding video clips and things of this nature. And especially in watching the documentaries, it was, there was so much great information out there. Um, and we loved pieces of this documentary and this approach from this documentary and, you know, visuals from this documentary over here, but there wasn't anything that necessarily was the whole package for us. And so we, because of what we were going through individually, um, the biggest question in our minds is why doesn't everybody know about this? I mean, this is so phenomenal. All of us have experienced these things that are so transformational and have totally changed life. So why doesn't everybody know about this so they can feel this way too? And that's when we really started thinking about, okay, well, you know, how can we tell the story without, without actually telling our story on camera? How can we tell the story? And, and that's when, you know, Paul said, well, why don't we tell it through the stories of other people? And it became a passion project at that point for how we reach a larger audience with this life changing message, not just sound cliche, but that's exactly what it is. So, so, so I'll, and I'll add to Mary Lee's because for me, I will like, you know, agree with everything Mary Lee said, except I'm, I'm cynical. I think I said that earlier. If I didn't, I'll repeat it again. I'm cynical. So for me, the, the film was, well, I was actually extremely thankful when I found out this information, but also at the same time, really aggravated because I felt like I had had information that if my father would have had this information, first of all, I don't know that he'd have gone through what he went through. But then secondly, he, I mean, he was religiously taking his meds. He would never miss a med. I mean, had someone just told him, Mr. Kinnamer, if you will put the chicken down, put the steak down, stop the, you know, drop the processed foods. And if you'll literally just eat a whole food plant-based diet, you, your life will change and you won't have to worry about these issues. But no one even hinted at that to him whatsoever. So for me, it was like, why did that not happen? And I was a little aggravated because these are not cheap procedures, obviously. And then on More top of that, yeah. <laughs> and, and then, and then on top of that, it was like, I mean, I'm, I'm 47. So I'm at that age to wear these things and I'm just finding out about it for myself. What's the cover up? Why, why is this not, you know, why is all these bad foods being subsidized and all this? So for me, Marilee probably had a lot more positive out, outlook on things. But for me, I wanted to know more. But honestly, I was more probably frustrated at the idea that, man, this is this is ridiculous. And and I had we wanted to make a film that that I hoped would uh, we hoped would would make the sell to 
everybody because for me, if we had just interviewed a handful of physicians, it, it could, it may or may not have been, you know, it might may or may not have sold me on it. But we tried to get doctors from California to New York and everywhere in between uh, because we want to make the point that this is not just a California thing or something like that. This is literally, this is, this is true. This is happening. It is happening all over. And, uh, and yes, back to your initial point, I think was going out and interviewing these physicians was so incredibly, it solidified in our minds that we were doing the right thing that, uh, we, we were so blessed to get the, the doctors that you Very mentioned much. to get, to get Ornish, Esselstyn, Campbell, Barnard. Furman, Barnard, Gregor, all these, yeah. these, yeah, Gregor, these Mount Rushmore doctors in the movement, you know, so to speak. That was such a blessing to to be able to kind of bring those guys together in a film, along with, like you said, James Cameron and people that we had no business being able to interview, but we were blessed to be able to do that. So we hope that it made a compelling and a pretty convicting, you know, story that you'd want to make that change. But anyway, that's so, yeah, it had a great impact on us. Yeah, I mean, I, I have the same sense of frustration, you know, working in mainstream medical system. Uh, it's like, why don't people know about this? Um, and uh, I, as a radiologist, you know, <clears throat> frequently I go into people's charts and get a little bit more clinical information when I'm report, reporting their CAT scans and whatnot. And it's astonishing how many medications people take, and usually for medications that are lifestyle-based that could get better. Um, and sometimes they're young, and they're on, you know, a dozen or more medications, and you're thinking... If only their physician knew and was pitching this to them, their lives could be radically changed. Um, but uh, so I'm really glad that you do what you do. And it's it motivates what we're doing, too, to try to, you know, just educate people. Um, I think education is sort of the missing piece. The knowledge is there. The evidence is there that this is a good way to go. But we've got to get the information out there. So yeah. that's what really motivates us. So in regards to disease reversal hope, the one thing that I remember about that film that was just so impactful was the number of physicians that had some of these chronic diseases and issues, the, the physicians that you had interviewed in disease reversal hope. And can you tell us a little bit about how you stumbled upon these physicians and their stories? I mean, there was the one cardiologist that had the horrific, I think it was rheumatoid arthritis. Um, Dr. Brooke Goldner, Monica too, Agarwal. Story. How did you stumble upon mm -hmm. these people? It was just so impactful because it was, there was the cardiologist that had lost all the weight. I mean, it was physician after physician and they're all going, mm -hmm. my God, we changed our diet and we healed ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So well, can you talk a little bit about that uh, documentary? I'll say it just for a minute. Yeah. I'll, so I'll start by saying, first of all, we can't take credit really for a lot of that. that a lot of that was Dan Purgis because he and Scott Stoll were writing a book. So they kind of forwarded on some of these stories and we kind of collectively picked the stories that we felt would, well, there are several factors, but one of the things that Dan wanted to do of which we agreed completely with was to me, nothing communicates, it gives the message credibility than to have a physician themselves talk about what they went through because this, you know, here we are talking with someone that has had the education, has, has, had, has gone to medical school, but yet still didn't know this information. And to me, that's that sort of really tells the story of, of what's truly happening is that doctors are not being educated about this. So therefore, they don't know how to what they are to do. And to me, if the general public sees that, that's just a, that gives them a great sense of what what they're really up against and how difficult it may be to find someone to to help them, you know, because. For me, I wanted to always believe everything that my physician told me, and I'm not here to slam physicians. That's not that's not what I'm meaning to, to say. It, but you want to believe what your physician says, but your physician can't help it that he hasn't been told these things. And so I thought Dan had a really good idea of taking us down this path of interviewing primarily physicians in the film. And so yeah, that was very. I thought that was a great move on his behalf. Now, Mary, I'm sorry, I'll let you talk. No, absolutely. And you know, it's eating you alive, going through that process and, and finding those stories um, was because at the time that we were doing that, it was, it was still pretty new, you know, um, Forks Over Knives had just come out in 2011. And when we were working on this, it was 2000, early 2015, 2014, end of 2014, early 2015. And so these transformational stories were still relatively new, you know, 
And so we knew that we wanted to interview people from coast to coast, like Paul had said. So, and, and we did want physicians to tell the story there too. And so we literally started using the internet to, to look for whole food plant-based transformational stories in Nebraska or, you know, cause we set off on our tour and these are the stories that we found of Dr. Crawford in Tucson and Jimmy Conway in Oklahoma city and the physicians in California and Oregon. And, you know, this, this is the way that kind of these all came about. And then interviewing all the, those physicians, um, they were all part of what was growing to be the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, so ACLM. And so they were all getting together and networking and more physicians were coming on board there. And so then you start hearing from those physicians about other people someplace else. And so that was a real opportunity for us to kind of grow our reach and our network and getting to know and getting acquainted with some, becoming acquainted with some of these stories of these other physicians. And we have since found more that we would love to include in another documentary because there are new up and coming young physicians that are discovering this earlier in their career, which is wonderful because that just means there's so many more people that they can help as their career, um, you know, progresses. So. Equally fascinating to me will be these physicians who have children and they've raised their children whole food plant-based. And it's going to be interesting to see the health of those children as they go through their life. And hopefully they will not be dealing with so many of these chronic diseases that most of us as Americans have had to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking from the physician's point of view, you know, I didn't know, I didn't know I'd been a physician for almost 30 years uh, before I really found out about this. And I, you know, read Dr. Greger's book and I was just blown away by it. And it was like, you know, why didn't I learn about this in med school? Uh, and then you just see what you do as a physician in a completely different way. You're looking through a completely different lens that so much of what we do is actually almost futile in comparison to what you could, the results you could get if you put it in combination with a whole food plant-based diet. Um, so it was, it was a real life-changing experience for me. Um, uh, you know, like I, I had amazing changes. I, I dropped my cholesterol from 330 down to 143. And uh, I was getting pre-diabetic blood sugars and they were cured in like literally four days. Um, and uh, so it was kind of a life-changing thing. And then, uh, and then I met Joyce a few years later and uh, told her about it. She yeah. tried it and she had some big changes. Um, and, and it wasn't that difficult for you. No, it wasn't. I, I was like a combination of you, um, Paul and Mary Lee. So I grew up on a dairy farm. So I, I, oh my gosh, I love dairy. Dairy was the hardest thing for me to give up because I was such a cheese hat. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and oh my God, talk about constipation. <laughs> I was chronically <laughs> constipated and I never connected it with the cheese. And I remember yeah. talking about it with my um, family uh, family physician and they were like, oh, you should start taking Metamucil. Um, again, Americans, we just want a pill. We, we don't really yeah. want to um, look at the root, root issues. Um, and of course I was eating like steak almost every night. So but I, at the time I met Lee, I was dabbling in fasting. Um, I was really big into juicing, but mm -hmm. what he presented was just too fascinating. And I thought I'll give it a try. He said I could eat as many potatoes as I wanted. And uh, I just lost nine pounds without even trying. Yeah, she didn't really have much to lose. Yeah. Um, um, but it was kind of effortless for yeah, you. Yeah, it was effortless. Yeah. And I just, I remember feeling very clear headed after about a month of eating cleaner. Um, and since then I've been hooked. I'm now starting to garden. I'm learning how to cook more recipes. Um, but I'm really curious from your vantage point, where do you think the whole vegan slash whole food movement is headed? I think it's starting to pick up more momentum. Do you think that there's hope for the medical community to further grasp and start teaching this in medical school? I mean, what, 
if you were to put a pulse on the whole food plant-based movement, where do you think things are at? Do, oh, okay. Uh, that's a, that's a great question. And, and I, uh, Marilee, do you want to answer it? I mean, I mean, I'll, I'll give you my I two cents thoughts, worth but... my, my thought. And I mean, you know, you're the physician, so I, I, you know, I don't know, but my, my concern is, uh, the pharmaceutical industry is so large and they will such a heavy, heavy, heavy hand in our country that I'm concerned that that's probably what's been holding it back maybe for a long time in medical schools and that sort of thing is the reason this information, it's not really that, it's, it's just inconvenient to let that information reach mainstream any quicker than absolutely necessary. So my thought, my hope is obviously that it's happening fast. And it does seem like I'm hearing more and more about, you know, the vegan movement. I still don't hear the word, the word whole food plant based as much as I would probably like to. But I do hear the word vegan a lot more than I ever did. Now that, you know, I live in a bubble. So maybe it's because of my bubble that I'm in now. But I I think it's becoming more and more you know, prevalent and more more common to hear it. However, I am concerned that the drawback is going to be the pharmaceutical industry and the, the pill for every ill. They make so much money and have over the last few years, they've, I mean, it's just ridiculous what they have made. And I think that may make it more difficult in a sense. That makes, you know, that'd be my concern. I don't know if you've heard of Nina Teicholz, but she's, Nina Teicholz is one of these low carb advocates and she gets substantial funding from uh, the, the beef association um, yeah. and, you know, she's out there pitching that, you know, the vegan diet is, is nonsense and got to eat meat and low carb. Um, and there's, there's not a lot of, uh, we have the truth on our side though. So I think that that's going to help promote it as time goes on. Oh, I do. I do hear. And, you know, th there's been several of the physicians that we have spoken with and, and stayed up with that have been developing curriculum. Uh, for medical schools and have approached medical schools. And, and we're hearing some of the new doctors coming out of school that said that they're getting some of this nutritional training and being taught this. There are some hospital systems that are more progressive in, in talking about, you know, incorporating more plants into your diet. They're probably not as... Um, stringent, <laughs> maybe as we were when we first dove in, which is, you know, I, I hear a lot of people talk about approach and how, you know, you don't want to be real dogmatic about it uh, with people. Sometimes people need to wade in a, a little slowly. And, and I understand all that. I, I think that the only issues that we ever saw or experienced with, with the approach of kind of easing into something is that motivation becomes a problem because none of us like to do anything for very long if we don't see results, you know, because if, if you're going along and you don't really see any results and you're like, oh, well, this isn't working, so why should I do it anymore? Because it's inconvenient. And so, you know, we always kind of encouraged people to, if you're going to try this, dive all in and dive all in for at least 21 days, you know, so you can kind of get past that two-week transitional period and then really start seeing some serious results that way because the faster you dive in all in the faster that you see the results and the transformation then it just increases your motivation for continuing the journey um, but we are seeing some of this i think in some healthcare systems as they're starting to, to push Embrace this play this uh, i know there's a couple of hospital systems that that took eating you alive and started playing it on their in-hospital networks for patients, uh, specifically those that were in um, the area of the hospital that were being um, admitted for diabetes, metabolic issues, heart disease, that type of thing. Um, so that's encouraging. Um, but at the same time, I think there's a lot of confusion even now out there because the more that kind of veganism or, you know, whole food plant-based ideology started to grow, then you have industry who sees an opportunity, of course. And so then you have industry that's diving in and developing processed plant-based foods um, that contain a lot of, you know, fat, sugar, and oil. 
um, and then marketing that as somehow being healthy when a lot of these products are not any healthier than the other processed food that was there that contained all of that stuff um, and, and including meat, you know. So I think that has raised a lot of confusion now because now you have vegans who are still suffering from some of these issues because they're very unhealthy because they're eating a lot of vegan products that are very processed. And so it's like you start to take two steps forward, but then it's three steps back, you know, so it's always an educational issue, I think, going along. Um, it's always that's always going to be the challenge, I think, is educating people because there becomes so much information out there and through the Internet. It's so prevalent that you have all of these voices talking. It's difficult to get down to what really is the truth and what really works, you know, because there's so much Especially controversy noise. over it. But like but like like you said, Lee, I mean, we have the truth on our side. And I think that ultimately we know we know that nobody wants to go through these chronic diseases. We know that nobody wants to do that. So ultimately, hopefully that's going to, that's going to win out. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was just working on a script for an upcoming video this morning and making that very point that if all you do is eliminate meat and then, you know, make up the difference with vegan junk food, you're going to be absolutely no further ahead, which sort of undermines the credibility of what we're, you know, trying to promote. Um, but, uh, just to your point about the med schools, we had the, the privilege of talking to Dr. Clapper on our podcast, you know, and he's, he's doing that project where he's going around the med schools and, uh, pitching a whole food plant base. I mean, it was, it was so nice talking to him. He's, he's such a nice man. Mm -hmm. Um, and he's been doing this for decades and decades. Yeah. He's one of our favorites. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He, he's just such a gentleman, you know, he's so nice to talk to, yeah. um, do you have any new projects that you're working on that are related to whole food plant-based lifestyle or? <laughs> well, we actually we, finished. <laughs> we have, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're finishing up one, but we probably won't say anything much about that. But actually, the, most of our projects right now are, are more uh, music related, actually. <laughs> so they don't have anything to do with. with but we have a couple of lifestyle ones that are, you know, in the conceptualization stage. So, yes. Mm -hmm. Nice. Mm -hmm. Nice. That's good to hear. I know that we have talked about um, an interest in potentially looking at doing a documentary related to cancer care. You know, and it really ties back to what you had said earlier, Paul, about the pharmaceutical industry. Um, you know, yes, there have been some significant advances with some drugs in the cancer space. I mean, mm -hmm. Gleevec for sure is, is, is a home run hit, um, Catrota. Yeah. But I feel like there's just so much misinformation. And again, individuals that are diagnosed with cancer, unfortunately think because there's so much attention around genetic testing and all these new targeted therapies, immunotherapies, a lot of individuals think that we're just this close to curing cancer. And so it's more pills, more pills, more pills. And unfortunately, the opposite is true. There are so many drugs right now in the area of cancer that are getting approved that shouldn't be approved. They're looking at very poor endpoints. They're not doing the long clinical trials aftermarket that oftentimes the FDA is required of these uh, pharmaceutical companies. And when they do, lo and behold, we discover that they may extend life by a week. I mean, it is just outrageous what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we certainly look forward to kicking the tires on these ideas with you. And I can't thank you enough for your passion and what you've brought to life because I have to say the small box entertainment, you're very good at what you do in terms of the production quality it's very appealing it's it's just amazing and and we're so excited mm -hmm. that you've given us your time today and we look forward to potentially oh. interviewing Thank you. you again oh yeah. it's truly our pleasure yeah we, we've enjoyed it very much <laughs> thank okay. you for having us thank you yeah well that about wraps it up is there any last words of wisdom now just keep eating plants okay <laughs> we'll do that for sure Awesome. Okay, thanks again.